C.S. Lewis was a convert to Christianity late in his life. He was agnostic and then went through a process of wrestling and then finally, as he describes it, came kicking and screaming to Jesus. And one man watched that journey right in front of his face and it was his secretary. His secretary watched his life prior to Christ, his life during the wrestling stage of wrestling with God, and then what happened after. And upon reflecting on this whole journey of C.S. Lewis before Jesus and then post-Jesus, his secretary said, C.S. Lewis was the most thoroughly converted man I ever met. Thoroughly converted. There was not a part of C.S. Lewis that hadn't been turned over to the Lord as far as this man could see. And that, that's something for someone who works with you every day to say about you. Would your, would your employee, your friends, your coworkers say that about you? <laughs> would your wife say that about you? Emily would say it about me, I'm sure. Would the people closest to you, when they look at your life, say, the best way I can describe what's happened to you is you, you are thoroughly given over to Jesus and his gospel. There's just been such a radical reorientation of your life and your heart and your affections and your obediences that you are thoroughly converted. Uh, we've been talking about a man named Paul, and if you don't know Paul, he was a man who was thoroughly converted. He, he came out hating the church and trying to destroy the church and kill Christians, and he went from persecutor to becoming a preacher and a builder of the church. And, and every part of his life prior that he had used uh, to hurt and, and, and display his own glory, to hurt the church and display his own glory, he was now using to give God glory and abandoning himself of any glory. And, and basically, the process of Paul going through this was uh, G- he meets Jesus and everything changes. And Paul eventually goes on to plant churches and tell people about this Jesus who can change everything about you. Paul knew the power of God's radical grace. And as he begins to plant these little churches and they gather, he moves on to another place and plants. And he moves on to another place and plants. He will often correspond with those little Jesus communities that he started. And he comes into this little place called Philippi. We've been studying about this place. And he plants this church. And if you remember, the church was planted in a very odd way. It was this kind of fashionista district wealthy woman named Lydia. She was a seller of purple dyed goods, which means she was wealthy and affluent. She asked him to stay at her home, and that became his ministry base. And then he converted uh, this demonic possessed slave girl who was being exploited. And then he got put in jail for that because they were trying to use her, and his, her boss wasn't happy about that. And then he converted the jailer, okay? That's his church plant team. He's like, that's a good team. Let's start there. And that little core group of people and their households and their families become the base for the ministry of Philippi. And Paul goes on after planting that church and plants other churches. And everywhere he goes, this church partners with him. They give themselves to Paul. And Paul cannot say enough good things about them. And Paul, 10 years down the road, is back in jail again. He he starts another jail ministry from the inside, all right? And he's in jail again, and he hears about just how they're doing and what's going on because they sent another gift to him via this man named Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus almost got sick and died on the way to give Paul the gift. And Paul's like, man, I cannot say enough about you as a church and you as a people. And Paul just continues to gush over them and remind them how thankful he is for them and what it is that he's doing and how his chains are for Christ and how they should remain unashamed of him and Jesus and keep moving forward. And Paul just wants to instill in them some joy. And and I love how Paul's a needy man who's in jail. He's broke, he has nothing, and yet he's still trying to give. He's receiving and he's giving. There's a mutual reciprocity in that relationship, right? And, and, And the main chapter, if you could say that, of this whole letter we, we found in chapter 2. And chapter 2 ta- uh, talks the story of how God became a man, and not just any man, but a slave, and not just any slave, but a slave who would die on a cross. And, and it's this story of how, called the Christ hymn, how God condescended and came really, really low and humbled himself. And, and really, that poem becomes the centerpiece of the whole letter of what Paul's trying to do. Because right before the poem, Paul says, look, I, I want you guys to live in light of the good news. 
I want you to live out your lives worthy of the story of Jesus. And, and, and really, this town was in a very um, kind of Roman uh, colony called Philippi. That was very, uh, there was a lot of patriotism, which meant that they loved their Caesar. They loved him. They worshipped him. Literally, they considered him a god. And so to come under the allegiance of Jesus as Lord is to say, Caesar's not Lord, Jesus is Lord. It's to say, I follow a new king now with a new empire, a new way of thinking things. I, I don't believe that Rome's going to give me peace and justice, but I believe Jesus is. And so it's a whole new way of living your life. And the best way Paul could help them to see how to be thoroughly converted was to lift up the story of what God did for them, how low God came for them. And so Paul says, I just want you to live in light of the story. And let me just tell you the story one more time. And Paul goes on to say, this story is a story of how God went from, ra- from riches to rags. Because we are in rags and he enriched us by him coming down. And that poem then becomes the way that Paul starts to see all of his life. He says, we've been transferred into a new kingdom with a new king and a new outlook of sacrifice and generosity and radical commitment and love and goodness. And he presents this beautiful vision of life that starts with submitting yourself to the way of the cross. And he begins even to say, let me give you some really clear examples of people who have been thoroughly converted by the cross. He says, Timothy, he, it's a guy, he's, I'm going to send him to you. I'm in jail, I'm sending him your way. He's going to pass you guys for a little bit, help your church, make sure everything's good. He says, I don't know anyone who's more genuinely concerned about other people's needs than Timothy. That guy just has a heart for people, like God did, like God in Christ did. And then he says, or Epaphroditus, the guy you sent to me, he got sick on the way, COVID-19. He got sick on the way, no, it wasn't that. Um, he got sick on the way, almost died, gave his life, risked it. That reminds me a lot like Jesus. When he gets back home, you make sure you honor him. Throw a party for people like that, man, because they are showing you what Christ looks like in the flesh. And Paul, not trying to brag, says, you know, I, I'm doing that too. He says, I, the way I would describe my life is pouring myself out like a drink offering. I'm just being wrung out for the glory of God everywhere I go. I'm just, as much as God can get out of me, I'm just going to pour myself out. He says, in fact, man, I I personally would rather die so I go be with Jesus, but I'm going to stay here. All right? It's part of my sacrifice is life. All right? Because I just want to pour out more for the glory of God. I want to reach more for the glory of God. Just God, use me, spend me, pour me out for you. And then he goes on to say in very specificity uh, how God had to pour him out, how God had to rid him and empty him of some stuff. Because Paul wasn't a nobody. Before Paul came to Christ, he was a somebody. He was a big somebody. He was educated. He came from the right family, right side of town. He had all of the accolades. He was, uh, you know, moving up in status well beyond all the others of his contemporaries of that age. Paul was a somebody. And Paul says, you know, when I look at everything I had, the the language I spoke and the culture I came from, the background I had and my studying, everything, and I put it all in the middle and I see everything that was good in my life before Jesus. When I look at it, it looks like a pile of garbage now. Compared to what I've got in Jesus, I had to empty myself of every good thing to get God. And it was worth it. I'll do it again. Paul says, put everything I have into the middle. Put it all in, put it all out. And I will leave all of that if you'll just give me Jesus. Paul says, I consider it all garbage or loss or rubbish. It is a net zero, worse than zero. It's a negative in my eyes because it makes me distracted from the main thing, which is Jesus. Paul says, my heart has been so captured by the cross and the way of the cross that I will give up anything as long as it means I get more of Jesus. And Paul is trying to show us that sometimes the biggest obstacle in our faith is not repenting of bad things, but repenting of good things that get in the way of God. That that is actually maybe the biggest threat to our faith today. And, and, and Paul now is at the end of this letter, and he's done some more pastoring. He, in fact, talked to these two ladies in the church who had strong personalities who couldn't get along. And he taught them, hey, the way of the cross is to learn to forgive your enemies, because that's what God did for you, remember? And he says, you just got to remember that Jesus is going to come back. He's going to fix this whole thing. Can you guys work this out and agree in the Lord? And he's kind of dealt with this little, you know, fire. And now he's coming around the bend here. At the very end of his letter here, 
he's going to tell them once again how thankful he is for them. And really, he's going to give us the ingredients of what we call, what we might call a gospel movement. What I mean to say is Paul is about to tell them why his ministry has been so successful, why it's been endured. He's about to tell them how he's been able to keep this movement going. The movement he started 10 years ago at their church, he's continued and he will continue. And Paul, as a church planner who's starting new churches, is going to tell them the secret sauce, the ingredients, the fuel of how to keep the movement of the gospel going forward. And there's three things. I I know that from God's perspective, there's a lot of supernatural work that needs to take place for lives to be changed. But from a human perspective, on earth, what does it look like to have the gospel go forward? And this is very important for a church like ours. Because uh, I don't know about you, but I don't just want to go to a regular church where we kind of you know, pay our dues, go to church and go home and nothing has changed. I want to see a gospel movement taking place, not just in this valley, but in our world through this church. In other words, I don't want to settle for just cultural Christianity where we're all just kind of pat each other on the back like, hey, you're good, I'm good, we're good, let's be comfortable together. Instead, I want to look to Paul, to the way of the cross. It says, what do I have to give up so that God is made magnified in Jesus? Where can I put more of my joy into Jesus? And so there's three ingredients to making a gospel movement work, to making our church moved and motivated by the way of the cross. And the first of those three is a joyful sacrifice. If we're going to see a gospel movement in our culture, in our world, and in our, even our city, in our valley, it's going to require a joyful sacrifice. Paul says this. He says, I'm so happy that you have now revived your concern for me. He says, I know that you guys wanted to take care of me. You just lost contact with me for a little bit. He says, but man, I'm just so happy that you guys came when you did. He says, and I'm not even talking about like I had all these needs. Paul says, I don't want you to think of me as just moping and waiting around like, man, when are they going to come through for me? Paul says, no, no, no. I have learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. I know how to be brought low. I know how to have a lot. In every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. Did you know that there's a secret to life? There's a secret. There's a secret to any situation you're in, finding joy. Paul says, I I learned it. I've been initiated into the secret of life. And he says, and guess what? It doesn't have to do with your circumstances. It doesn't have to do with what's going on, what's happening to you. It doesn't have to do with how much is in your bank account or how much is missing in your bank account. Paul says, because I've been broke and I've been balling and neither of those brought me the joy I needed. I've been hungry, and not just because I didn't get my lunch break. I've just been hungry because I didn't have food in the pantry hungry, all right? And Paul says, but but I got a secret that helped me to endure all things. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. And then Paul starts talking about sports, because I'm just playing. That verse is not about sports. Um, I'm just playing. (laughs) Gotcha. Um, There's nothing wrong with using that verse for sports, but that verse... What it's talking about in the context of this passage is when you've been initiated into the secret, you realize that you can put up and go through anything as long as you have the secret. You guys know what the secret is, right? Well, I'll tell you again. Lean in. Jesus. If you have Jesus, you really have all that you need. And if you put everything else that you could ever acquire in your life on one side, and then you put Jesus, and you had to choose between the two, only a fool chooses everything else. And if you spend your whole life acquiring a happy family and a happy life and a nice home and a good name, and you are the kind of person that's respected and elevated in your whatever group you're in, and that actually gets in the way of you having a connection to Christ, The Bible would say, what does it profit if you've gained the whole world, but you lost your soul? In other words, the only thing more important than gaining everything in the world is your soul. And and have we lost our soul individually? Have you lost your soul this morning? Are you soulless because you've forgotten Jesus, the main thing? Is our church soulless because we have gotten really concerned with programs and with personalities and with a culture that we're setting, but we've forgotten the main thing. Because if we have all of those things, great ministry programs, great preaching, great worship, all the lights and bells and whistles, but we forget that it's actually all fundamentally about one man named Jesus, 
we are impoverished. We're blinded all the same. Paul says that's the secret. Because that secret of Jesus will allow you to be radically sacrificial, to joyfully sacrifice everything else. When you have the one thing, everything else is just, it's, it's extra. Contentment comes with Christ and nothing else. I know some of you are in a situation where you're thinking, I would be a lot happier if I wasn't in this situation. And that might be true. To some degree, there'd be some relief. But think about before this situation come up, was there perfect joy still? Right? I mean, think about the times in your life where you hit a crisis and you thought, I'm never going to get out of this. And then you get out of the crisis and then you go back to that same kind of low-grade level of this something missing. Right? Like, isn't that true? And so the crisis is not the problem. The Christlessness is the problem. So how do we take hold of Christ? Well, I think we have to do what Paul did, which is go the way of the cross, which is to say everything else has the opportunity to blind me from the main thing, to distract me from the main thing. If, if I had to say the opposite of contentment is coveting, covetousness. Covetousness is this heart posture that says, man, if I just got a little more, I'd be okay. Like, what is the thing in your life right now you're saying, I just need to be okay? What is that thing? I just need my kids back. I just need my marriage back. I just need some more money. I just need a, a better reputation. I just need my mother-in-law to like me. Good luck. I just need dot, dot, dot. What is that thing you're thinking, man? If I get that, things will be fine. That's coveting. That's this insatiable desire for more when the more could never get you where you want to be, actually. My daughter and I work through the catechism every night. And, uh, well, most nights when I'm not tired, we'll work through a question and answer. And it's really cool because I see her using it in daily life. She'll ask me questions and just kind of answer it herself. With the, and so it's really cool to see. And uh, her favorite part is the Ten Commandments because she likes to tell everyone sins. Um, so she'll be like, well, mom broke this one today, okay? I'm like, okay, we're going to get to self-righteousness soon, baby. Um, and she'll just, you know, always mention, like, what, what sins she's seen out there. And so the other day we were sitting there watching The Little Mermaid, and that scene comes up where she wants to go and be, I want to go and be where the people are. And she's kind of going through her collection of all this stuff. And she realizes that all the stuff she acquires just isn't enough. And it kind of climaxes where she swims up to the top and goes, I want more. You guys know what I'm talking about? That scene where she's, like, swimming up. And so, so she says, I want more. And when Olive and I were doing coveting, she didn't understand what coveting was. So I had to teach her, coveting is don't want more. That, that's the idea is you, you shouldn't want more. You should be happy with what you have, Olive. And so when Little Mermaid swims up and says, I want more, she looked at me and says, that's not in the Bible. All right? <laughs> She's being thoroughly unbiblical. And I was like, amen, baby. That's right. She, she sensed that the, 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 the insatiable desire for more is is not what Christ came to offer us. Christ didn't come to offer us what the world can offer us. More of what the world can offer us. Isn't that wild that we come to Christ and then want what we wanted before we had Christ? It's not what he died for. Actually, when the Bible describes sin, uh, a lot of times it'll describe it with this word often translated passions or desires. Romans 1, uh, it's, it's this Greek word epithomeia. It's translated desire or passions, but if you took the word apart, epi means over, uh, thumea means passions. It's your over desires. It's inordinate desires. It's the heart longs for something too much. A lot of times our sins are not wanting bad things, but wanting good things too much. And they've ballooned in our heart and they become more important than Christ. What is the thing that is you're over desiring? Because coveting is all around. We live in a culture that is deeply covetous. I mean, think about every advertisement ever. Like you are bombarded daily with coveting as a temptation, right? Society's feeding you. Every advertisement's like, your life sucks. But thank God you got deodorant. And you're like, oh yeah, like, yeah that's great. Deodorant makes my life better. I'm going to buy some. And then the next commercial, like, yeah, but you're still a loser because you don't have this car. I'm like, oh, I guess I need the car, you know? And then you're like, but you're also a loser because, and it just keeps going. And you're like, I need that. I need that. That'll solve it, right? And, and it's just, fee and there's no commercials. Like, your life is actually great. I'm not trying to sell you anything. Go to church. Like, there's no commercial like that, right? A commercial wouldn't sell. People would be like, boo, cancel them, all right? Because coveting is what 
fuels the society that we're in. Greed, more, more, more. And what happens with a covetous heart and not a content heart is you begin to compare and compete. You, you know what I'm talking about? You look at others, what have they got? And you're looking over your fence saying, man, I wish I had that. Or you're measuring up going, I'm glad I have that and they don't. And it's this heart that, that it weeps when others rejoice. You're bummed out because the person down the road got a, got a, a promotion you didn't. You think, why didn't I get that? I deserve that. I've worked harder than that. That's a covetous heart. Or you are rejoicing when others weep. Someone falls, they get fired. Like, yeah, all right, cool. Now there's an opening for me. And all you can think about is your position, your competition, your comparison of where you're at in relationship to others. And the lie behind this covetous heart, this lack of contentedness, is that God is holding out on me. That God was not giving me what I really need, what I really would ha- If I had it, I would thrive. One woman writing on this, she writes a book called The Envy of Eve. And she says, coveting is, is this desire to see, you see what you want, you covet it, you take it, and then it leads to hiding. She says, you, you see something you want, you covet it, you want it, you take it, and then it leads to shame and hiding. And she says, when we're thinking about taking things, it's not just that we steal what's not ours, but oftentimes we, we take from people rather than giving people. We take their value. We take their dignity. We take their integrity. She says this, we take away from a friend's reputation when we gossip and share confidential information. We take away from missionaries or those in need in our community when we spend carelessly when they have great needs. We take away from another's joy by failing to rejoice with her because we believe that God has failed to be good to us in some area. Our sourness about our own situation takes away from her joy. Here's the thing is, is, is covetousness just infects a community. And Paul says, man, I don't have that. I'm joyfully giving it all up because I have Christ. And here's the thing about contentment. You got to hear this. Contentment is not just something you learn when you don't have anything. I know a lot of you think that uh, I need to be content when I'm broke. When things are going bad, when my circumstances are terrible, that's when I'm learning to learn how to be content in Christ. Paul says, no, I had to learn this when I had a ton and when I had a little. Because both of those situations will, will actually tempt you towards coveting. Because when you got nothing, there's a temptation to say, God, I need more than what you're giving me. Give it, give it, give it. And when you have everything, there's a temptation to say, this isn't enough, give me more, God. Or I made it, why do I need God? And Paul says, in either situation, whether you have nothing or everything, there's always a heart that is infected with needing and wanting more. And so the key to contentment is not is not getting out of the bad situation. The key to contentment is getting into Christ. Because at the end of the day, contentment is really a heart that trusts in God's sovereignty. It's a heart that says, whatever season or life you've designed for me, I'm going to lean into and trust that it's good for me. I'm going to trust that you have a fatherly heart that's concerned for me and that knows more than even what I can see, God. You take pleasure in giving me good things, so I trust you. I'm not going to compare because comparison will always rob you of joy. Competing will always rob you of joy. There's this really comical story in the Gospel of John. I think sometimes we don't like laugh at the Bible because we're just not reading it right, right? Because there's some funny stories in there. Like, there's one funny story, for instance, John is uh, running to the tomb, and he writes, and I got there first. Like, there's, 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 there's like, no reason for that theologically, so I just want you to know, I toasted that dude, all right? That dude sucks, right? I beat him in the mile, you know? And, and like, it, there's obviously this, like, you know, wrestling match, this competition between Peter and John, right, in this letter. And, and there's this funny part where after Jesus resurrects from the grave, he goes and he restores Peter. Remember, Peter denied him three times. It's this, at breakfast, Jesus basically says, hey, do you love me? Peter says, yeah. Finally, Peter gets fully restored to ministry. And Peter and Jesus are chatting after that. It's kind of been a very intense emotional moment. And uh, at this point, Jesus says to him, hey, um, I just want you to know that this is how your life is going to end. So Peter leans in. He says, it's not going to go well, man. He says, you're going to go where people where you don't want to go, and you're going to get dressed by people. Who you don't. In other words, you're going to have no control over your life. Basically, you're going to become a prisoner. And eventually, it's going to lead to a really horrible death for you. Your life is going to end really hard. That's what he tells Peter. He kind of warns him. <laughs> and the Bible says, literally at this point, this is what, what the Bible says. Peter turns around and sees John and says, what about him? <laughs> it's so funny. Jesus is like, you're going to die. He's like, what about that guy? Like, you know, like, get that, he, that's his life. What's my life? <laughs> right? Like, it, literally, 
just said, and, and Jesus gets mad at him. Jesus says, what if I want to keep him up till I return? That's what Jesus' response is. And Peter's like, oh, <laughs> he gets the good life, right? Peter's so angry, but Peter literally has such a covenant. He says, I want his story. Some of you want someone else's story. Because your story's hard. And that you can't see how this story ends with joy. But if you would give yourself up and trust that God has your story in his heart and in his mind, maybe you would see this is actually a story perfectly designed for you. This is not a theory for Paul. Paul says, I had to learn it. I had to wrestle with it. I had to learn how to just really lean into this. It was hard, but I got there. I've learned the secret. Do you know the secret? I've learned it. This is action for Paul. Got rid of all that stuff and started going to jail instead of jailing people. I just gave it all up for Jesus. This is real for Paul. Uh, This man named Charles Blondin in 1859 was 160 feet above Niagara Falls, and he crossed several times between Canada and U.S. across the Niagara Falls. He was a tightrope walker. And crowds began to gather and watch him as he would do these feats. And he famously did tons of things that were just unbelievable on that tightrope. He, w- he walked across it on stilts. He went across it on a bicycle. One time he carried a stove out there to the middle and made an omelet. Okay? And every time he's doing this, people are like, yeah, do the omelet thing. That's cool, right? And then he gets a wheelbarrow, and he goes across in a wheelbarrow, and everyone's like, yeah. And then he comes to the crowd. He says, all right, everybody, how many of you think, how many of you think I could carry 200 pounds in this wheelbarrow across this rope? And everyone curls, yeah. And he says, is there anyone out there who weighs about 200 pounds? No volunteers. Anyone, I'll take anyone across. You guys believe. You saw the omelet. We saw the omelet. You think I could do it. We think you can do it. Anyone want to go across with me? You should go. No one wants to go all of a sudden. They're like, just do the omelet thing again, man. Right? What happened? Oh, it's fun to enjoy and to cheer when you're down here. But to get up into the wheelbarrow and go across, that's a terror. It's a terror. Christianity isn't standing with the crowd. It's going across the tightrope. It's saying, Jesus, I will go the way of the cross, and it's going to terrify me. But I've seen what you can do, and I see and trust with my whole life, and even my death, that you're going to take care of me. For a lot of us, Christianity has become this mental exercise where we stand in the crowd, and we go, oh, look at what God can do. I believe it. This is awesome. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. And then Jesus says, are you ready to walk? Are you ready to sacrifice? Are you ready to go this way? And we say, I believe, but I don't know if I'm ready to trust. Paul, when he talks about learning, he's not saying he got it. He's saying he got it. Number one, a gospel movement requires joyful sacrifice. Number two, it requires loyal friends. Now, I love how Paul talks about these friends. Look what he says. He says, you guys shared in my trouble. You guys were there in the beginning when I left. The church, no one entered into partnership with me, only you. Even when I went through Thessalonica, you guys gave me all of my needs. I'm not seeking the gift. I'm just seeking the credit. You guys were there with me every step of the way. Earlier, he says, man, I hold you in my heart. You're my people because I love you because how committed you're there for me. There's, there's transactional friends, and then there's best committed covenant friends. Paul says, you are covenant friends, not transactional. Transactional friends are people who are there for you as long as you're fulfilling your end of the deal, whatever that is. If life is good, they're good with you. But when life gets bad, they kind of bow out of that connection because now it's too costly, right? It's too costly. I heard a a speaker who used uh, three types of friends, and I found this so insightful and wise. It was so helpful. And I want to offer it to you. I think it's a wise way of thinking about your friends. He says, there are confidants, colleagues, and comrades in life. A confidant is someone who's for you. You trust your, you can give your whole heart to them because they are there for you. They are committed to you. They got you. They're in it with you. You you hold them in your heart. They hold you in their heart. And there's just a sense of like, man, whatever it is, I don't care what it costs me. I'm, I'm loyal. You got me and I got you. Confidant is, man, my marriage is in trouble, and they're going, 
Our marriage is in trouble. Man, things are bad at my job. Things are bad at our job. Right? I just got some money. We just got some money. Right? You know what I'm saying? There are people who share in everything. Paul says, Philippi, filled with confidence. You share. You partner. You're in fellowship. It's whatever I'm experiencing, your experience. We're just like this. Those are confidants. Colleagues. Colleagues are not for you. They're for the vision. And what I mean by that is they're committed with you along the way of life as long as you're both pointing towards the same thing. They're good to have. You need colleagues. Most of the people we relate to will be centered on the same vision. Maybe it's we are colleagues in this thing called motherhood, and we're both focused on motherhood, and that's kind of our thing. And once our kids get older, we maybe may lose that close connection we once had. Or, or maybe we're, we're into building the church, and, and if you move on from the church, we're done. We're not going to be friends anymore because we were, both had the vision of the church. Or maybe whatever, it's a job or a business, but they're not really committed to you. They're committed to the vision. Now, there's this third category called comrades, and comrades aren't really for you or for the vision. They're just against things that you happen to be against. Be careful about comrades. They're not bad, but as soon as that mission is up, that objective is completed, they may turn their guns on you. So those are the ones we've got to watch out for. But here's what this speaker said, and I want to offer it to you because I think it's such a wise gift. He said, most of the hurt I've seen in life and in ministry and in churches is when you treat a colleague like he's a confidant. When you treat someone who's for the vision like they're for you, you give them your heart, and then suddenly something happens with that vision, and they get derailed, and now they're no longer for you, and you're left broken and hurting, holding the bag. A lot of hurt happens because you thought, man, I thought we were in this together, and they were just in it for the cause, and somehow you became an obstacle to whatever cause, and they were out. Confidence will uh, never leave you or forsake you, but a colleague, he will leave you when there's a cheaper price for the same vision somewhere else. And, and I, I love this paradigm because Paul says, the thing about the church at Philippi is it were my confidants. They were for me even when it was hard to be for me. Even when everyone else was talking smack about me. People started talking smack about Paul. If people talk about you, you're in good company, all right? Because they used to talk about Paul. He did nothing bad. This dude preached the gospel, got put in jail, and everyone's like, oh, he has a, he has a record. Oh, yeah, for Jesus, you know what I mean? But, like, people were gossiping about Paul, and he's going, man, I knew it got hard to be my friend sometimes because I was broke, and people were talking about me and saying all this bad stuff, and, and I'm, you know, Paul would go into a city, and everyone would just start rioting because he was preaching the gospel. He did that in Thessalonica. That's why he mentions it. He brings up Thessalonica because he goes, you guys stood with me through the riots. You know what I mean? When I showed up in my ministry, everyone wants Jesus to repent, and they're like, kill him. Like, you guys were there with me. You guys didn't bow out and take, a por- take your support away and say, hey, we don't know about your reputation. We don't know if we want to stick with you in this because you've been doing some pretty nasty stuff in the community and it's kind of ruining our witness here in Philippi. So we're just going to remove this support. They, they doubled down. They said, we're with you through the riots, through the jail, through every moment. As long as you're in the fight, we're in it with you, Paul. Because you're my people and I'm your people. and We are together. And Paul says, I hold you in my heart. You're my confidence. You guys need confidence in life. You need loyal friends who will stick with you. No matter the cost or no matter what you are going through, they're going to show up and be there for you. Um, I'm thinking of a story where uh, I had an elder actually at this church. There's only three, so you can guess which one. Um, they're good dudes, so it, it's true for all of them. Um, I, uh, I was kind of like in this really like season where I, tr- I, I um, needed to share some stuff in my own life and heart. And I was kind of nervous. Like, I don't know if I'm actually, I should like share what's going on. And it was just like, you know, like that ugly stuff of what's really going on in your life and your marriage and your ministry. And I was concerned. I didn't want to share. Um, and I feel, like I, I, I feel like I needed to. And so I, I finally, my wife's like, you need to talk to someone. So I did. I went to this guy's house and I just started to tell a man, here's where I've been at. Here's what's been going on in my heart. Here's some of the struggles I've been having. Here's some of the suffering I've experienced. Here, And a lot of it was like embarrassing hard stuff to say. You know what I mean? It wasn't like easy or comfortable for me at least. It felt very vulnerable. And so I'm going through this whole list of stuff, kind of like I got nothing else to hide. Here are all, here's where all the, you could bury me with this information. Here's where all the bones are, the dead bodies are. There you go, bro. And I just gave it to him. And, and, and I remember this moment 
where I said, I, I, I know I needed to tell someone, and specifically one of my leaders, um, but I've been so scared that if I said this to my leaders that maybe they wouldn't roll with me anymore. They wouldn't want to be, they wouldn't want to be with me anymore. They want to be loyal and kind of by my side. I'll never forget what he said. He said, Joe, you're right. I'm just like, he didn't say that. No, I'm just like, he said, he said, Joe, do you want men who only love you when it's easy? Or do you want men who know the worst and still with you after it all settles? And then he said, I actually knew everything you already told me. <laughs> Thanks, Brawley. Um, <laughs> I already heard all that. He said, but I, I, I signed up already with all that knowledge. I didn't sign up because I, didn't, I thought this great. I, I've lost my great impression of you. I already knew that. And I'm here because I know that I still am committed. That's a confidant. That's someone who's like, I, it's not that I just have this great view of you. It's that even when things are hard, I'm there with you. Paul says, that's Philippi, man. They see me in trouble and they, they, they're with me. They're with me. I hold them in my heart because they're my friends to the end. This man named Earl C. Willard tells a story of these two men who grew up best friends. And one was named Jill and one, uh, Jim, and one was named Philip, and they did everything together, including after the college going into the Marines. And one day during this fierce battle, there's this heavy gunfire and uh, just a really clo- close quarters combat took place, and they were given the command to retreat, so they all start running back to retreat. And as the men were running back, Jim noticed that Philip hadn't returned. And so he started to panic and look around for his bro, and he knew that if Philip wasn't back in another minute or two, that he wouldn't make it. So he begged his commanding officer, let me go back and grab my friend. But the other, the officer forbade it. He said, no, that's a suicide mission. Jim didn't care. He risked his own life. He disobeyed, and he went back into the fight for Philip. His heart pounding, gunfire flying, he found and called out for Philip. And a short time later, his platoon saw him hobbling across the field, carrying a limp body in his arms. Jim's commanding officer was incredibly upset, shouting. He said, what a foolish waste of time. What a ridiculous risk. Your friend is dead. There was nothing you could do. You got there too late. No, sir, you're wrong, he said. I got there just in time. Before he died, his last words were, I knew you would come. That's friendship. It, it's, it's, I'm not just with you when the battle's easy, but when it's hottest, I'm going after you, even if it's just to comfort you with your last kind of commitment. That's Paul, what he has with Philippi. You need loyal friends. You want a gospel movement? You need to have that kind of like, I'm with you in this. No matter where you go or how you are, I'm in this. Last thing you need for a gospel movement is radical generosity. Radical generosity. Paul says, time and time again, you guys have supplied all of my needs. You send Epaphroditus, and I just consider that worship to God. And because of how much you've given to me, God's going to provide for you. All of your needs. All of your needs, God has you because you've had me and those in the mission. And, and there's this radical commitment to being what's called a gospel patron. You don't know what a gospel patron is. It's um, the reason that the mission of the gospel gets out is because people financially back it. Now, let, let me be clear. God don't need your money. But the reality is ministry takes money. And we don't even, we're not embarrassed of that, of saying like we worship Jesus with our money. We're not trying to take your money. Some people go, hey, you're trying to take my money. No, Jesus is trying to take your whole life. That's just a part of it, okay? Like, it's way bigger than just your wallet, bro. It's everything you got, okay? You're in or not, okay? And so, but part of our worship to God is money. And, and, and every big movement of God in the history of the world had people behind it, financially backing it. That's just the bottom line. And you can see this in the Bible. You can see this in history. You can see this at this church, People faithfully, generously, sacrificially saying, I'm going all in and eternally investing in the mission of Jesus. Do you guys know what ROI is? Return on investment? You make an investment and you have this expectation of what the return will be on that money you put down. The ROI for gospel ministry is eternally secure and eternally compounding. It is the best place to go. I'm all in on because there was a guy who was dead on Friday. He, he wasn't dead on Sunday. And Easter Sunday means that my ROI for every minute that I sacrifice and give of my time, of my treasures, of my talent will always matter to him. 
He elevates and secures every sacrifice I give. It's hard to be a Christian. Time, talent, treasure, that's a lot to give up. And it can feel pretty pointless sometimes. But the return on investment for that is eternally safe. And the Bible tells us that a church like Philippi is necessary for a man like Paul. Behind a great pastor like Paul is a great church like Philippi. Behind great missionaries are great support teams. There's actually this analogy that kind of uh, that many missionaries use, in fact, called holding the rope. And it's about, it kind of goes back to the original modern missions movement in America. These Baptist guys got around and they were deciding who would go out into the mission field. And, and one of them, Andrew Fuller, began to think of it in these terms. He told Carrie, one of the men who was going to go out into the mission field, and he ended up doing great modern mission work. He says, you're going to go into the mission field. It's kind of like you're committing to go down into this deep, dark hole. He says, but in order for you to be safe, we have to hold on to the rope as you descend into the hole. He says, you go and we will hold the rope for you. Not everyone could go into the hole. Some people need to hold on to the rope. Some go down, some hold on. This is the analogy for missions. Some go, some give. Not everyone can go, some have to stay back and give. And what you're doing is part of that mission of holding the rope. And so Paul says, man, you guys have held the rope for me, generously, sacrificially paying my way because you were committed to me. Have you guys ever seen uh, the, those prayer hands? I think I have a picture of it. The prayer hands, um, maybe like in a bulletin or just in like art or whatever. Um, yeah, I, my grandma had that tattooed in her neck, you know, like that kind of thing, right? Like generations ago, everyone just had it, right? Like prayer hands, um, teardrop, right? Um, those prayer hands are like everywhere. It actually comes from this nam man named Albert Dürer. He was a famous German Renaissance artist. And... He was commissioned for these praying hands, um, and it became kind of a classic. But the story behind the person whose hands he used to model these prayer hands after is actually really special. Um, it, the legend goes that uh, he had a friend he grew up with, who were, and they were both very talented in art. And they found out in college that they both wanted to do art, but not both of them could pay for art school. So his friend said, why don't you go through art school? and I'll pay your way. And then when you're done, you come back and you send me. And so he did. For four years, that man paid his way through art school. And then when he returned, he found that his friend who had been paying his way was essentially um, so broken by the labor that he was in that his hands were crippled. And he could never, ever do art again because he had given himself completely, including his gifting, to his friend. He'd essentially transferred his trust into his friends. I'm gonna pay your way. And he could no longer go through art school. And he was so broken for this guy because he thought, man, I, I took your dream. And he was bummed out about it. And one day he he's, saw this man. He was kneeling down and he was praying and he got inspired. And he said, I, I'm, can I try your hands? And those are the hands. It's a man who said, I'm going to pay for you to fulfill what you got going on. I'm going to stay back. That, that's Philippi and Paul, gospel patron. The church can only work if people are sacrificially willing to commit to his mission. That's it. Like Jesus, he, he, he's the son of God. Son of God, owns the heavens and the cattle and a thousand hills on it. He's, he's God. And when he came to earth, Luke 8 tells us that he was funded by a bunch of women. Did you know that? Luke chapter 8 mentions Martha, Mary, a bunch of women who are wealthy, who give their money to support the son of God's ministry on earth. The, the patron behind the ministry of Jesus was a group of women who were wealthy and generous. Like that's wild in that culture. That women funded the greatest movement in the history of the world. That they put in all their money together and said, this is return on investment. We're going to give it to the Son of God. And he went out and he was able to minister freely because some women said, we got you, Jesus. We believe in you. And here's our money to prove it. Paul, is, is, he has the, the, the support of churches like Philippi and other churches holding on to the rope, supporting him. Luke, when he writes the gospel, he mentions this guy, Theophilus. That's the guy who's commissioning the gospel of Luke. That's the guy who's paying for Paul, to, for Luke to go and get all these accounts and eyewitnesses. Someone had to pay for that. Theophilus is the guy who paid so that you have the, book, the gospel of Luke in your Bible and the, and the book of Acts. Romans mentions this woman named Phoebe who's called the patron who serves the church. It's like the church meets in her house and she basically backs the whole thing financially. In, in this church in Philippi, there's one woman named Lydia 
who sells purple goods, who opens up her home and becomes a ministry base. She is the wealthy benefactor of the whole mission here. I mean, again, we have men, you have women, you have different kinds of people from different backgrounds, but they all have one thing in common. We're going to push all of our chips in on the return on investment on this eternal mission. We believe in you, Paul. We believe in Jesus and what he can do through you. And so we will sacrificially push in all of our chips behind you. You can just look at church history. I mean, I have tons of stories, like, like tons of stories I won't get into, but he, here's one. You guys know that Bible that you hold in your hand? We didn't always have Bibles in our, in our whatever language we speak. For, for many years, after about 400, it was translated into Latin and stood in Latin for about 1,000 years. 1,000 years, it was in Latin. And this man named William Tyndale decided he wanted to translate it into uh, English. He wanted to translate it into English. The problem was it was illegal. So when he approached the Church of England and said, hey, can I, can you, will you guys support me financially to translate? They said, no, we won't. You'll get in trouble if you do it. And so he just became a pastor and began to preach and teach because he was in Latin and no one understood Latin and no one understood Hebrew. None, no one understood Greek. People needed it in their own language and William was committed to that. So he would often preach about it. One day, a businessman sitting in his church, this, this businessman named Humphrey Monmouth, heard him and said, God has called you to do something. You're going to do it. He says, don't worry about preaching. Come live with me. I'll provide for you. I'll protect you. And you can get to work. And over the course of six months, William Tyndale began to translate the Bible as passionately and fast as he could. He translated the whole New Testament. Six months of committed work to just translating the Bible from Greek, Hebrew, and Latin into English. And when he had finished the work, he says, well, now I need to go to the printing presses, which are overseas. It's the best technology we got. He said, I'm going to put you on a, 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 one of my boats that goes out for business. And you're going to hide. And we're going to get you there. And he does. And then he says, and then when you get those Bibles, there's 3,000 of them made. That's all they could afford. It's all they could get out. They put them in, in bins of oil and wine to smuggle them into countries. I mean, can you imagine how much you got? What you got? A new King James. You know what I mean? Like, it's wild, bro. NASB, ESV, right? Like, like, these dudes are slanging Bibles because if you get caught with that, you get put in jail. Well, one man becomes a Judas-like figure in the life of William Tyndale, befriends him, and eventually betrays him and turns him over to the officials. For 450 days, he's in jail. He is saddened. He's broken. And it eventually leads, it eventually leads to him being brought out to be hung. He's hung. And on the day when he's hung and his body is to be burned, any last words, his words were, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. Open his eyes. That was it, and he was hung, and he never got to see anything of what he did. His benefactor was caught and put in jail, and eventually he died too. Neither of them ever seen the impact of what they've done. But about 75 years later, the king, his heart was turned, and a Bible was produced. You may know it. It's called the King James Bible. God answered that prayer and the return on that investment impacted the rest of the world. For 400 years, that was the staple of all of our Bibles. And, and the versions we have stand on the top of works like the King James Bible, all commissioned by one man and a businessman who sat in this lowly church who said, I'm in, I got you, let's make the gospel go forward. Oh, what do I got to offer? I don't know. But maybe if you're willing to put it in, you can see what Jesus can do with fish and loaves. I can tell you story after story how the Great Awakening and George Whitfield's preaching was backed by a woman, Lady Huntington. I can tell you the story of how John Thornton placed John Newton in an influential church and then had him sponsor a, a song and a hymn book. You may know the song as Amazing Grace. I can tell you story after story of how great movements of God were about people who were saying, let's go, we're all in on this. And, and you know what? When you are this way, when you are joyfully sacrificial, when you have loyal friends and you have radical generosity, you have the ingredients, the human ingredients anyways, of a gospel movement. You know how I know? You know how I know? Look what Paul says at the end. Everyone says, hi in Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. And all the saints here greet you. Especially those in Caesar's house. <laughs> it's so cool. It's so subtle he's like, you know that, 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 that mammoth empire where there's this king who's the lord of the world, Caesar? We have some people in his house. Our kingdom's doing okay. Our, our king is okay. This movement's fine. We got his uncle. You know what I mean? We got his cousin. 
There are some people in his house who follow the way. So don't be convinced that Caesar is Lord because he's not. Because the gospel is taking root because of people like you. Now we can be a regular church if you want. Or we can be a church that's committed to joyful sacrifice, loyal friendships, radical generosity. Which if you think is actually just the story of the gospel. For the joy set before him, Christ went and endured the cross and was a friend loyal to the point of death, even death on a cross, radically, generously giving of himself. And if you look to him, maybe you'll become like him. Maybe our church will be a gospel movement. And maybe there's someone here who thinks, man, I need to get in. I need to go deeper. I don't know how, but I just know that I need to be more sacrificial today. I need to be more loyal today. I need to be more committed. I need to be more generous today. How, how, how do I get in on this? That's the Holy Spirit, and he's trying to lead you to empowering a gospel movement. He's trying to lead you not just to be satisfied with what's the bare minimum, but how can I lean into this return on investment and give it all to Christ?